Our next presenter is taking the stage. This is Mike Thompson. Mike has over 25 years experience in the stream and wetland restoration industry. His background has primarily been focused on assessment, design, construction, and monitoring of restoration projects. But he also has experience with stormwater management retrofits, low impact design, as well as ecological master planning. Mike is a qualified forest professional with the Maryland DNR, a professional wetland scientist, certified ecological restoration practitioner, and a certified senior ecologist. Mike has completed all four levels of Rosgen training and has a background in biological monitoring for macroinvertebrates and fish. He has a love for just about all things outdoors and focuses on improving habitat for all things great and small. So take it away, Mike. Thank you. Appreciate it. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, the benefits of Beaver Dam analogs from a construction standpoint. Uh, but I also want to thank the folks who helped make the project I'm going to talk about possible, uh, mainly Arundel Rivers Federation. They were our client on that on this project, but also the good folks at Biohabitats designed this project. This was a follow-up to the last project you just heard about. So we'll talk a little bit about the evolution of that uh, that detail that Joe showed you. And also the good folks at Anne Arundel County, Eric's here too, so I'll point him out. All right, so who am I? You heard a little bit about who I am. Uh, I'm a Hokie, I'm a very proud Hokie as most of us are. If Doug was here too, he'd maybe give a little shout out. Um, I am a bug and fish geek. That's really what I like to do. I enjoy the critters in the stream. Um, I, I've been a big picture person also for most of my career, most of my life. I just like to see how these things interact. And part of every goal of every project should be how the plants and animals and physical, chemical, biological, all that interacts with one another and how those all play an integral part in the ecosystem function. So who cares? Well, probably everybody in this room cares, right? You're all here for a reason that this stuff is important to you. So everyone should care, but most importantly, I think the critters care, right? They need those ecosystem processes. They need all the habitat. They need everything to function properly so they can have proper habitat because I'm pretty sure this mayfly is gonna have a hard time finding a mate in a CarMax parking lot. I don't think that's an ideal spot to find a mate if you're a mayfly. So um, last time I put this picture in a slide, I didn't have it zoomed in quite far enough and nobody could see the frog on the tree. So that's good, pretty good camouflage there. So why beaver dam analogs? You all pretty much know the answer to this, but we need to come up with better solutions for our problems nature-based solutions that provide more resilience to climate change, more habitat, and more function. You know, again, you guys have heard this, you guys know it, beavers are keystone species. They are one of the most prolific engineers that we've ever had in this continent. They use locally sourced materials. How can we build projects using locally sourced materials? You know, Maryland, we aren't allowed to capture and relocate beavers for now. Some people say that you can, but most people say you can't. So we're just going with you can't on this slide. So one day maybe we will be able to, and we'll be able to do this for a lot cheaper. Uh, but for now, unfortunately, people like Eric have to spend a lot of money to do projects like this. And we have to get grant money from the good folks out there to help build these projects. So... We want to take our lessons from the beaver. We want to emulate what they do and how they do it. But we also need to think about what our restoration goals are. You know, are our goals nutrient processing and flood control? Are they just bank stability? Sometimes we have infrastructure we have to protect and there are municipalities out there and entities that just care about infrastructure protection. They do not care about the other incidentals that some of us like to care about all of it. So this is my professional opinion. We all need to challenge each other to do better work and to come up with better ideas and to push regulators to accept these ideas. You know, I, I was talking earlier to some folks 15 years ago, how many floodplain reconnection projects were there in the state of Maryland? Probably zero. 
right? We've been changing the MO over the years, and now we're finally getting to the point where floodplain reconnection is widely accepted. As long as you get buy off from the property owner, whether it be legacy sediment removal or raising the invert of a stream to reconnect to a floodplain, they're both becoming more popular. And it's good to see because these projects before, I mean, we've been replacing projects now. I mean, the lifespan of some of those projects that were put in 20 years ago, they've kind of come to the end of the line and there are projects out there that are being repaired. So the company I work for, Meadville Land Service, we are actually going to be repairing one this summer that was constructed in the early 2000s. So some of these things, we need to come up with more resilient options than just putting rock in the stream. So these are a lot, lots of questions I like to ask, you know. Are we doing the right thing? How many people out there have done a stream restoration project, either designed it or built it that they didn't want to because the client said to do it? Yeah, sadly, one is too many, right? One hand going up is too many, but it happens. Yeah. Does this design work in the stream? You know, the old Rosgen approach that some people still, you know, want a Rosgen stream design. You know, does the approach work in the stream? Does the beaver dam analog work? Does floodplain reconnection work? You have to analyze all these things and make sure everything's coming together. Uh, are we doing it for the right reason? Are we doing it just for credit? Are we doing it for habitat? Are we doing it for stabilization? And will the project be completed in the most environmentally sensitive manner? Some projects require a lot of tree removal, and we know that is a huge topic right now. There are a lot, there's a lot of pushback against stream projects because of the tree removal. Is there a better way to do it? There probably always is a better way to do it, and we just have to come up with those ideas. So how do we get better at working together to improve project outcomes? It's all communication. It's all discussions that we have to have with the clients, the engineers, the contractors, the regulators. We all have to come up with these solutions, vet them through, and try it. Why? Because there's a problem. We've got a lot of sediment going into our streams and into our bay. You know, sometimes every stream has a different solution. This stream down here, this is down the coastal plain. That is a really large tulip poplar. I could probably stand under here. This is all fine sediment. There is like a 300 foot floodplain on the left bank. And that's a perfect place for a beaver dam animal. Very low energy system. This project up here, not a chance. Too steep, too flashy, too narrow. There's no way a beaver dam analog is gonna work there unless you're you know, one of the prehistoric ice age giant beavers that were once in North America. But I don't think those are around, but it'd be really cool to see one of those beaver dams. This project over here, maybe, but that's why we need good sound engineering to tell us if that'll work. You know, that's probably not the safest place to be. That's a pretty steep system, pretty erodible soils. This starts from a 24 inch pipe. All that came out of a 24 inch pipe. So you can imagine what it looks like downstream. So I wanna talk a little bit about Beards Creek. This is a project down in, uh, it's down in Riva, Maryland. It's outside of Annapolis. Um, here's Annapolis. Here's Route 50, 97. This is where all the beach traffic is, right? So our watershed is pretty small. It is surrounded by suburban development. It's not too bad in terms of suburban development. This one's only about 30% impervious. A lot of us are used to working in 40, 50% impervious acreage uh, watersheds. Uh, the drainage area is only 238 acres, not very big. It is a second order stream. It's fed by two stormwater management ponds, and they don't do a very good job containing the sediment anymore. Uh, and there's a lot of nutrient issues coming out of both of them, evidently. There's a decent amount of forest in the watershed compared to most, but you know, it's still a, it's still a suburban stream. So the objective of this project was to use beaver dam analogs to reconnect the floodplain. This wasn't excavation of the floodplain. This was filling the channel back up to reconnect. So here's those two stormwater management ponds. That one's covered completely in duckweed. This one has some nutrient issues. The other stormwater management ponds, pretty big facility, but evidently all the water coming in is pretty, pretty heavy with some of the nutrients. So what does it look like beforehand? And everybody accuses us of taking nice, pretty pictures, 
before pictures of the ugly beforehand so i found some nice snow covered pictures to help make it look a little bit better so we have an inside stream you know we don't have a lot of diversity of habitat down here you know we were talking about joe mentioned it in the last one also you know there's not a lot of habitat in there you got a really shallow system uh there's not diversity there's not a nice pool riffle diversity in there we have incision that is going up into the floodplain. You know, we're losing hydrology in some of these wetlands in the floodplain. So that's why raising the invert on this one was, good, was a good approach to take. Plus, fewer trees to lose than excavating a floodplain out. So it starts, uh, the upper end is at an outfall. The only rock on this project was to help uh, improve this outfall. But then the rest of it was done using complete completely done using wood, woody debris to create beaver dam analogs. So more pictures, you can see more erosion. Um, again, there's, this is a channel that probably shouldn't have even been a channel, but it actually had base flow to it. Uh, down at the bottom end is the tidal interface. So it's a creek that's well used by some of the residents in the area. They like paddling up there. So the stream gets used kind of from all sides by the residents. So how do we get from this with our three foot in size channel? That's about hip height on me right there. It varies in height, but keep note of this red maple tree here. So how do we get from this to this? That's the same maple tree right there. So we've gone from three feet deep to two tenths of a foot deep. I don't know if I call this a zero stage channel, maybe like a 0.5 stage channel, not, not quite completely uh, inundated at the, at the first drop of rain, but it gets pretty wet pretty quick out here. So that is actually the same stream right there. And it's greening up. This was right after construction. The trees had just got planted. So how do we get from that picture to this picture and how and why? Well, how is to create a base flow channel. Use these woody debris structures, these beaver dam analogs to create a base flow channel. Some approximate information there, cross-section width and depth for you all. But the why is so we can get some nutrient reduction out of this. These were some calculations provided by biohabitats for the presentation, so you can see some of the information in there. But importantly, what you can see is what our shear stresses are. You know, we need to understand this information, so we need to know what size material to use and if these beaver dam analogs will be sustainable in the system. So, Joe, I probably could have loaned you some of these slides. So when we build these things, we got, we got to kind of make a muddy mess, right? We come in here, we put the logs in across the stream, and there was no excavation for the structures. The footer log was about it, but in this system, it was basically putting the footer log in and just pushing it down into the mud. Because luckily, being in the coastal plain, the sediments in here allowed us to do that. So we come in, put a couple logs in, Put that fabric across the back. Joe, you talked about crisscrossing them, and I'll, that helps keep that flow, you know, trap groundwater, force it over the top a little bit. And then we put a few layers of wood, followed by some mud, followed by some wood, followed by some mud, and we pack it down with our, our prototype beaver analog tail. So once we get enough layers in there, we're kind of creating like a little, little mud and stick uh, layer cake there. Then those root wads Joe talked about. Is that a good picture for you, Joe? You want that one in the next next presentation? We have these hydraulic thumbs, right? It lets us pick up these root wads and shove them in and help hold all that material down. We use some cedar post at the downstream end, put some more woody debris in there just to help build that. That kind of acts as like a little scour prevention. At the end of it, we have a structure that looks like this tied into the banks, and this is what helps hold our grade, these ups inverted root wads. They're resilient, they're stable, and they provide some good habitat as well. There's a lot of macroinvertebrates who love those interstitial spaces of those root wads. So some of our challenges while we're doing this is all the groundwater and mud. Now, this project was construction, constructed in the wintertime. Uh, we had a high groundwater table anyway. Uh, not to mention the fact that site access, we had one access path coming in in the middle of the project. We had to go upstream and downstream from there. 
the upstream portion was fine. We went from upstream to, to the middle of the site, and that was fine because we're building the groundwater up and it's out of our work area. But once we go downstream and start to work upstream, all we're doing is increasing the groundwater and it makes it harder for us to move around in there. So you can actually see down the lower end, this is a three ply mat road to get in. And we kept having to build that back up because it kept sinking in because the ground was getting so soft from all the water. So another challenge is this tree loss. You know, projects, like I said before, uh, there's a lot of scrutiny on stream restoration for the tree loss right now. So when we have a project like this where we can use woody debris, we can go through this floodplain and we know trees that tulip poplars aren't going to survive this inundation. Our red maples, our pin oaks, our black gums, uh, the swamp white oak that was in there, all those things can help, can survive some of that inundation, but trees like the tulip poplars can't. We can use that material. We can use all the invasive shrubs that we pulled out of here, all the bush honeysuckle for the, the wood matrix that goes in there. We can rip those invasives out. By inundating this floodplain now, too, we can help prevent more invasives from coming back in the future. But a project like this is great, too, because a lot of times in the construction world, you've got more woody debris coming off than you got going back in. That seems to be sh changing and shifting towards no woody debris comes off. It all stays on site. But when you have excess woody debris, you can import it to the site. This site, we received two loads of stone to beef up the rock outlet from the, the outfall upstream. And that was it. The only thing else that was brought in was the wood and, and cedar post. And the only wood we actually needed to bring in, because there was enough wood from all the invasive shrubs, that we only needed to bring some of the logs in and the root wads. And I think we only brought in about four loads for this project. And we had, I believe it was 40 woody debris jam structures in this site. So this was a picture I took afterwards to show you how much of the canopy is still there. It gets a little, a little thinner towards the bottom because that's where you can kind of get the influence from the tidal interface. There wasn't as much canopy down there. So another challenge sometimes you come up against is the neighbors. Uh, luckily, this neighborhood, everyone was in favor of this project. And the people who had the construction entrance in their backyard, they actually came to us and said, hey, if, you, if we build a couple owl boxes, will you guys hang them in the tree? So. It's good when you have neighbors like that. They become your allies. If you want to find them before a project starts, they'd be good to uh, get everybody else on board. So in a project like this, what did we do better than a beaver and what can we do? Or what did the beaver do better than us and what can we do better than a beaver? Well, we can improve those transitions to help maintain fish passage. Right? You don't see a beaver dam every 20 feet in a stream. It's kind of a waste of a resource for a beaver. It doesn't get the impounding that it wants or needs. But when we have a stream with enough drop, you know, the project we just heard about was they were six inches of drop and they only needed 60 structures over 18,000 feet of stream. So in a project that's a little bit steeper, we can make these drops only two tenths of a foot between drops. We can put more of them in. And by doing that, we have some redundancy in the system. You know, we're getting the water out more frequently because we have more structures. And in building those structures, we can maintain fish passage a little bit better. There is a lot of question about that out there about fish passage and beaver dams, and we won't get into that. But we can ensure in structures like this that we have that fish passage. We can make sure we're passing the stupid little black-nosed dace, the dumbest, slowest fish in the stream. Oh, I know. I'm sorry. I love them, too. They're all fish, right? But I, I prefer the cooler ones, but you know. Um, we can quantify our benefits. Beavers don't care how much sediment they're trapping. They don't care how much nitrogen reduction they're getting. All they care about is building their habitat. But we can, we can actually quantify that so we can take credit for it. We can use bigger materials. I mentioned those hydraulic thumbs. We can use those root wads, those inverted root wads, because what's more stable, an inverted root wad that doesn't need doesn't get maintained often we don't go back to maintain these things or a beaver dam where if the beaver's not there maintaining it you have the potential for failure we can more selectively use materials and import large materials I, a beaver may come in and take down every tree in the area 
And that's something that we as stream restoration contractors don't want to do because then we get in trouble for taking down all the trees. Plus, we want to make friends with all the neighbors. And we can take TMDL and MS4 credit. And we can monitor and adapt like beavers do. They adapt to their environment. They adapt to a structure's failures. They, you know, I'm glad you went to before me, guys, because that showing that beaver dam, how they built it on top of your structure, but then modified it to go around, they adapt. They adapt to their flow regime. So what were our benefits? Well, it was a much more ecologically friendly technique, right? We used a beaver dam analog to restore ecosystem function. Now, like I said, we didn't bring in any rock except for those two loads for the outfall protection. Think about the average stream restoration project that uses rock. How many truckloads of rock? How much effort went into blasting that rock, shipping that rock, the diesel it cost to get from wherever the quarry was to your site? Like, it's a big expense. Scott before talked about low diesel, no diesel projects. Like, it's a great way to go. It's a great transition to get to that point. Now, not every stream we can do that, but we can try in a lot of areas. And even a lot of streams where we have flatter reaches, maybe we can do that in some areas and mix it with woody debris structures and rock structures just to reduce our footprint. You know, uh, use of on-site materials, I mentioned that. Shorter construction timeframes. Putting these structures in versus a rock structure is so much easier because rock structures, when you have multiple layers of rock to get the elevations right. I don't know if anybody here works in Fairfax County. But Fairfax County has a tenth of a foot tolerance, vertical and horizontal, for their rock structures. And it's really hard to get a tenth vertical and horizontal when you got a rock that's this big. Or if it comes out of the quarry over there in Fairfax where the rock is square and it's three by four by four. So it's hard to meet your tolerances in, in instances like that. So multiple structures with little drop, reduced scour. More expansive floodplain reconnection. This thing is wet side to side out there. Increased sediment trapping, tree preservation, the increased wetlands, and just the reduced cost of it. I, it it's kind of a win-win. So got some more pictures up here to show, uh, just to kind of fill in a little bit of blanks. Uh, this is just post-construction. You can see we have some log sills that ran across the floodplain to help tie into the beaver dam analogs and then out the other side. The vegetation came up right away. Um, the ducks were actually in here as we were working our way down. They were literally two, three pools up. They were working their way in. And then the geese came in too. So this is the first growing season after construction. Construction finished in February. This was probably probably May or June following construction. So you can see how quickly stuff comes in. Oh, that was too quick. So you can see how just quickly it grows in. It's just a great process. And once you rehydrate that wetland, all the, all the seed bank that was in there starts to germinate. And you get a lot of things popping up you didn't see before that are native that you didn't plant. But like I said, this is wet from valley wall to valley wall. You used to be able to walk out there. You might get your tennis shoes muddy but now you can't walk out there in knee boots without sinking halfway up so all right thank you all very much appreciate it so kind of a, a multi-part question with the, the common thread of this being resiliency of these projects have been moved in to help build on to and add on to any of your instrument structures have you seen these things tested so far with any kind of major storm events and what do you think the lifespan of some of this is? And how does that integrate into the regulatory and permit process that you have to be answerable to? So first part, uh, there was some historic sign of beaver in there. Uh, no recent activity. We anticipate they're going to come in there. Uh, signs kind of point to it. There's a lot of willow and dogwood at the downstream end. We think the food source is there. We think they'll come in. Uh, I have not seen them out there yet, though. Um, the second, sorry, what was the second part of your question? So storm events. Storm events. So storm events, it has seen some big storm events. The flow is a little metered by the stormwater ponds upstream. But so far, the only thing we noticed in one of the storm events is 
where two channels came together, it kind of short circuited and went around, but there was a little bit of erosion there, but nothing that warranted going back in to do any fixes. So, and, yeah, long longevity of it. So that's one of the things that I personally am keeping an eye on. Um, I'm not sure what the monitoring plan specifically stated for this project, but most of that stuff is wet and stays wet. So don't anticipate it going very far, very long. Uh, I don't anticipate it eroding away very quickly because it, it's everything's so flat in there. There's not a lot of scour and the, the shear stresses were low enough. I don't think it's going to wash that material downstream. So, but time will tell. This has only been in the ground for a year and four months. So. Um, how much of the plant material did you all install? And uh, what do you, what happens if you have a big invasion of uh, invasives like knotweed? I've seen knotweed come right. when people mess with streams. So Arundel Rivers had a lot of volunteer planting events. They probably put right close to a thousand plugs in there. So there's a lot of iris in there right now. Um, a lot of pretty things going on right now in there. But I think it was about 600 trees and shrubs, about a thousand plugs. And in terms of the, um, sorry, what was the last part of your question? <laughs> just, the, the invasives. So I, I don't, I don't know exactly what was written in the monitoring plan. We constructed the project, but um, actually, Joe left. I was going to see if he knew about the monitoring plan for it. But if there, there. I'm sure there is an invasive monitoring plan for it. There were no, it was, you expect to see Phragmites at a site like this. There was no Phragmites. There was no knotweed that was evident within the project site. The, the usual suspects, there was uh, some stilt grass. I haven't seen the stilt grass come back yet because it's been so wet. And usually that stuff, there's so much seed bank there that just keeps popping, but I haven't seen that. Uh, there was no re canary grass at this site. It's pretty, uh, pretty shady, so. Um, I was just curious because you mentioned that one of the benefits of the BDAs is that they last longer than natural beaver dams. Um, but I'm curious since in a natural system, I guess beavers do move on and dams get washed out and the system presumably is still okay. So I'm, I'm curious about if in a project like this, you know, if if everything did get washed out and it did all get removed since you've already... I guess connected the stream to the floodplain. Do you think it would still kind of still hold, and that the ecosystem could kind of, you know, keep fixing itself, or would it immediately revert back to the incised channel that it was? I think with the number of structures. Well, to clarify one thing, if the beaver, if a, an active beaver colony remains, I would expect a beaver dams to stay in perpetuity as long as the beaver are there. Uh, some beaver dams will fail, fail immediately upon, you know, beavers moving out and lack of maintenance. But the there are a lot of structures in here. There would have to be a lot of head cutting to work its way through a lot of structures for this to fail and go back to the uh, physics dominated. Uh, as we heard earlier, physics versus bio biological dominated uh, stream system. So I, I think as reconnected as it is to the flood point right now, it would last quite some time. All right, that's our time. Thanks so much, Mike.